verse 1. And we're going to continue with the series that we've been doing at the Advent series leading to Christmas, leading to tomorrow, which we've been talking about the top line and the bottom line of Christmas. What is really Christmas all about? What is, what is this thing about Christmas? I mean, we hear so many stories um, over the years. It has changed from Merry Christmas to um, they took away the Christ to put an X Miss and now it's not even nothing to do with it. Now it's uh, what uh, greetings for the seasons or joy for the seasons or something like that. So what is the top line and what is the bottom line of Christmas? And that's what we've been looking at. And for those who are visiting with us, all our sermons are recorded and are put on Facebook or on um, YouTube, so you can follow the series there if you want to. But if you think about it, Christmas is perfect, isn't it? Hey? Christmas is perfect, but it's almost suspiciously too perfect, isn't it? Too perfect to be true. I mean, if you look at the story, it's almost like a story that someone will make up in order to get people to, to think about it and to follow it. Because life is not always like that. Life is not always perfect like that. And you know, the Christmas story doesn't begin with the angels appearing to Mary, but the Christmas story begins with an angel appearing to a couple who is too old to even have children. And they're telling that couple that they're going to have a child. Which was kind of the perfect because in those days, people thought that if you didn't have children, then God cursed you or was mad at you or you might have done something bad in your, in your life that you didn't find favor with God. And then the angels appear to Elizabeth and Zechariah and they say to them, you're going to have a son and you're going to name him John and he's actually going to announce the coming of the Messiah that the Jews are waiting for, that the world is waiting for. So it's kind of perfect, isn't it? Because it was a foreshadow of the fact that when Jesus grows up, when Jesus um, starts his ministry, part of his ministry will be to the people who, who others thought that they were out of favor with God because of something that they have done or maybe something that their parents have done. And they will never find a favor with God. So the story is perfect, isn't it? Because that's exactly what Jesus is going to minister to. Then the angels finally appear to Mary, and she's a teenage girl, probably about 14 years old. You probably didn't know that, did you? And the angels say to her, Mary, you have found favor with God. And Mary must have thought, well, I'm only 14 years old of age, how can I find favor with God? I haven't even lived my life yet. And the angels just say it doesn't matter, God has chosen you. He found favor with you, Mary, which again, if you think about it, is perfect, isn't it? Because throughout Jesus' ministry, he will go around showing favor to people who have not done anything in order to get that favor, and Jesus will show favor to those people who have done things that maybe displeased God. So again, there is a foreshadowing thing, and it's just such a perfect story. It's so perfect that it sets the stage of what Jesus is actually coming to do. And then maybe the best part of all of this is that the first people that find out about Jesus being born are shepherds. And as I said last week, we don't really quite understand about shepherds because we don't really have shepherds, or if at least we do have few shepherds, but we don't associate with shepherds. So this whole shepherd thing doesn't really, we don't understand it. You see, shepherds were outside, kind of an outcast in the time of Jesus. And they were outcast to this whole religious system because shepherds were seen as unclean. Okay? Yet in this perfect story, which is so perfect, the angels appear to these outsiders, unclean bunch of people, and they say to them, we want you to be the first to know that God has done something in the world, and God is going to 
do something incredible even more. And we want you to see it even though you've never been invited to anything religious because you always are looked upon as ceremonially unclean. The angel was saying, but God wants you to invite you to see and hear the good news. You see, it's, it's perfect because when Jesus grows up, in his ministry, he spends so much time going to people who are outside. who are known as unclean. And we'll often use a term that shepherds will understand in the way he was talking about him and us. And he will tell them that God loves them and wants a relationship with them. You see, this story is so perfect, it's too perfect to be true. And then there is like a broad narrative that we get a glimpse of that we have to, to know a little bit about a, his, a little bit about history because not too far away from where Jesus is about to be born is Caesar Augustus and you might have heard about Caesar Augustus that he was really like the first real emperor of Rome he reigned for a long time and created the space of, of peace in Rome, the Paxa Romana, which was later known as. And the interesting thing about him that makes the story is that his adoptive father was Julius Caesar, which was called, he was called the divine Julius. He was given the status of being a god, a deity, which means that Caesar Augustus was considered to be the son of God. So you have a son of God in Rome, who is ruling the world, and then you have the son of God being born in Bethlehem at the same time. And there is all this tension and drama that eventually is such a perfect story because the only time that you would ever hear about Caesar Augustus other than a paragraph in a book or maybe a lecture at varsity or in your history lessons, the only time you will hear about him is when we tell the story of Jesus. That the great emperor of Rome literally became a footnote in the story of a Jewish carpenter. I mean, it's absolutely perfect, isn't it? The story is just so perfect. And again, it's, so, it's too perfect to be true because life isn't that perfect. And as we, we saw a few weeks ago, life doesn't necessarily seem as random as we think it is. And that everything doesn't always work out. And when we are children, it's easy to accept the story as true. But when we grow up as adults, we begin to slide the story to the category of fable and maybe even fairy tale. And certainly a nativity scene doesn't help us, does it? I mean, this beautiful nativity scene doesn't really help us. Everywhere you look at it, it's almost like a cartoon, this sort of nativity thing, isn't it? And I mean, if you Google nativity scene, you will get a whole lot of different sort of pictures, these beautiful, perfect pictures. I mean, they all look so perfect in those, in those nativity pictures, don't they? They have this perfect skin and a perfect smile and perfect hair. And Jesus is blonde and blue-eyed baby. And you know how many Middle Eastern children are born blonde, don't you, with blue eyes? You're looking at one. Even the animals look so perfect. Okay, I don't have animals here, but if you Google, uh, do you have a favor when you go home and Google nativity scene? Even the animals look so perfect. Now, every woman here who is going to look or has looked at a nativity scene before, and if you had a baby, you would look at that building and at that surrounding, and you would think, you would think to yourself, I will never have a baby here in this surrounding. And if I do, I'm definitely going to have an epidural. Because I am not going to have this baby here. But if you look at this nativity scene, Mary looks happy, Joseph looks happy, everyone looks happy, and everyone looks so perfect. And let me tell you, any woman will know 
that it was not a silent night giving birth to a baby and so what do we do with the story that is too perfect to be true that's no that's no really people don't really believe in it and we create this kind of a romantic nice picture about it no wonder when we get older we take the story that has meant so much to us as little children and we sort of slide it to a category of maybe, maybe it was just a fairy tale. The strangest thing is that this is not even a good myth or a fable. Because those myths and fables, they normally have a moral point to it, isn't it? But what can you learn from this picture? I mean, what do you learn from the picture of the nativity scene? Is a moral story make a reservation? <laughs> hey? Call ahead and make sure that there is room in the inn. There is no real application for this picture, is there? It becomes a story, a myth to many people because it's too perfect to be true. And many people display this picture in shopping centers and on greeting cards and so on. Are you depressed enough? Because here's the good news. The good news is that to the rescue comes these two guys and actually bring us the bottom line, top line of Christmas story. And it's Matthew and Luke. And I mean, I don't know how well you know Matthew, but Matthew was one of those disciples of Jesus. He was a text collector. No one wanted to do anything with text collectors. They were an own category of sinners. They were the sinners and then there were the text collectors. Okay? So no one wanted anything to do with the tax collector. And here one day Jesus walks, he looks eyeball to eyeball to Matthew, and he says to him, Come and follow me. And Matthew says, Sure, let me just, you know, finish the books, let me just make sure that the books sort of like balance out and all that kind of stuff, and then I will follow you. Yes? No. Matthew literally left everything and followed Jesus. This humble to humble conversation with Jesus, whatever he said to him, outside of come and follow me, changed Matthew's life so much so that he decided to sit down and write an account of Jesus. And then there's Luke. Luke was not a disciple of Jesus, but Luke knew a lot of the disciples of Jesus. And as we will see, Luke was, many, many people know Luke as a doctor or an educated intellect. But, but he, was, he was meticulous about what he was writing. So Matthew, when he sits and he writes the story down, he doesn't start with once upon a time, but rather he starts with Abraham. And he says, Abraham had a son. He also had a son. He also had a son. And he meticulously goes through this genealogy that most of us find boring because you can't even pronounce the names of half of these guys because he wants everyone to know that jesus was actually a person who really lived who was connected to all the right people and that jesus is actually the messiah and he tells a story that he's about to tell as a different as it will be to believe that actually this place where Jesus was born and the people that Jesus was related to actually happened. And he dives into this complicated details of Jesus' genealogy. And he says there was an, a man named Joseph who's engaged to Mary and he finds out that she's pregnant and so the story begins and it becomes so realistic because it happens to you and me, doesn't it? Some of us know what a teenage pregnancy is all about. Some of us might not want to know, but we might know of someone who does know. And so all of a sudden this story that is too perfect, too perfect to be true all of a sudden makes sense and it becomes a reality and we see how God is going to work through all of this but then Luke is even better he wasn't as I said one of Jesus' disciples but he knew people like Peter and John and James and the brother of Jesus so 
so he sits down and he realizes there are so many different stories and accounts that he decides to get it right and he starts like this now if you got your bibles won't you look at luke chapter 1 verse 1 are you there And so he starts off and he says this, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of things that have been fulfilled among us. In other words, there are a lot of people who are trying to get this on paper. That's what basically Luke is saying. There are so many stories out there of people who are trying to write it down because it's so amazing And it's not a hundred years later, but around the time the events actually happen, so many people are trying to get this right that he says, and this is what he carries on saying, just as they were handed down to us, but those from the first were eyewitnesses, or servants of the Lord, I mean of the word. In other words, they were actually there. This is not some story this is people who were eyewitnesses so Luke is saying I've actually sat down with them and he turns on and he says with this in mind since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning in other words Luke decides to have an orderly account that reflects what actually happened and since I had access to all these people, I decided to put together an account of what happened because nobody is going to believe it. I mean, Luke is he, writing there because he realizes that the story is too perfect. He realizes if people are just going to read the story, they're going to go, ah, I'm not sure about that. Eh? And Luke, being an intellect, He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to investigate. I'm going to speak to eyewitnesses about what happened. Carry on reading it. It says, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty. Now, if that was your Bible, I would tell you, get a pen and circle certainty. But if it's not your Bible, just remember that certainty of the things you have been taught. You see, he's saying to them, you have been told these things, but I want you to know that this is not a myth. This is not a legend. This is not a fairy fairy tale. This actually happened among us, and our witnesses are actually still alive, and I'm about to tell you the story of how it actually happened in history. And then he does something extraordinary that does not happen in myth or fairy tales. He literally anchors the birth of Jesus to a very specific period in time. And he says this, look at uh, Luke chapter 2 verse 1. Quickly, just move to Luke chapter 2 verse 1. So he writes this to Theophilus and he says to him, Dear Theophilus, I'm going to do this. This is an orderly account. I've investigated. I carefully investigated. I've looked at our witnesses. And so I'm now wanting you to be certain about this. And just in case you sort of still not sure about it, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, he says, In those days, Caesar Augustus, there is that Caesar Augustus, the son of Julius Caesar, issues a decree that the senses will be taken of the entire Roman world. And then he gives us an even greater detail that people knew it was a period in history. He says, this was the first census that took place was while Cornelius was governor of Syria. Now, historians actually have a record of this guy. They actually find in archaeological finding, they find a record that this guy was a governor of Syria at that time. So it's not just a once upon a time. It actually happened long, long time ago. 
And then he says, a man named Joseph was visited by an angel. Mary was visited by the angel. And he took her to be his wife, went to Bethlehem to register. Because every male had to go to his hometown. And while he was there, she gave birth to a son and named him Jesus. And it turned out that he became the savior of the entire world. Now here's a question that I have for you. What if it was true? That it actually really, really happened? What if the faith you had as a child was true? And these events actually really took place in history? What if you knew with certainty that Luke knew and events actually took place? What if it is really real? And it's not just a story. And it's not just something for Christians to do on the 25th of December. But it actually happened. Maybe not the 25th of December, but it actually happened. And so it carries on in Luke chapter 2 verse 10 and 11. If you just move your eyes to verse 10 and 11. It carries on and it says, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will create, cause great joy for all. Now the interesting thing about that word all in the original Hebrew and in the original Greek is that all means all in Greek and in Hebrew. In other words, all everyone the entire world for God to love the whole the world that will cause a great joy for all the people today in the town of David a savior and what makes this story perfect is that God sent us exactly what we needed he sent us a savior to save us and says a savior has been born to you he's the messiah the lord you see it's better than perfect isn't it because it's true it's not just a story it's true it actually happened it's not a, a standalone story that we just remember to read it on christmas day it's not just a standalone story we can look at from time to time, especially over this time of the year. It's a story that encompasses my story. It's a story that encompasses your story. Because we are the all that Luke talks about. That he came for you. He came for me. He came for all of us. It's too perfect to be true. He bet you. Because he did it for you. And he did it for me. And that's what makes the story of Christmas such an amazing story that God so loved the world that gave his son to be Emmanuel, God, with us. And if that doesn't blow your mind away, then I don't know what will. If I don't see you tomorrow, may you have a blessed Christmas. And if I see you tomorrow, then we're going to carry on looking at the scriptures and this amazing, amazing story. Amen. We're going to sing one more uh, carol, number 393, Joy to the World.